Father God, we come to you this evening just to say thank you. Thank, thank you for allowing you. us another opportunity to be in this place at this time for this appointed reason. God, we ask that you continue to be in the midst of all that we do. God, we ask that you continue to provide for each and every one of us with the understanding that you are our shepherd. And because of that, God, we shall never want. So, God, I'm, I'm grateful tonight to be able to say that, that you're the head of my life. And because you're the head, I need or want for anything. God, I ask that you continue to bless this branch of Zion. Bless those who are within these walls and bless those who are around these walls, God. Bless the surrounding community. Bless those who have a mind to ask for what it is that they need and those that don't, God. You know what each and every one of us needs, so we ask that you provide that. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we bless your holy name. In the precious name of Jesus, we all say amen. 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 See you to the like two more minutes. Good evening, y'all. Good evening. All right, so we are in Romans. Come on in. Come on in. We are in Romans chapter chapter seven. We're in seven. Uh oh, y'all better be in seven. If 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 we if we're not supposed to be in seven, you better act like it's the first time you heard it. That's what I got prepared for tonight. Romans <laughs> so chapter seven tonight. No, but it, it should be chapter seven, though. Okay. All right. Last, because last week we finished up. Last week we finished up chapter six, where we were talking about being made safe for grace, and we talked about stubborn sins. Yes. Yes. Thank you. We talked about stubborn sins. Those are those were also called what? Stubborn sins, sins that you do all the time. What was that H word? Habitual. Habitual. Look at my star students. <laughs> habitual sins and then we talked about occasional sins as well and then we also discussed how you're supposed to walk <clears throat> freely in grace because Jesus' work on the cross ensured that we'd have that amen, amen. amen. and that and then we talked about that you know even though some of us even though we have grace some of us don't know how to walk freely in it so we discussed that so any other thoughts or questions um that you want to add about last week are you ready to move on all right, so we're moving to chapter seven, and this chapter is going to focus on exposing the weaknesses of the law. We've been talking about the law versus grace since the beginning of Romans, correct? Yes. And we are covered under grace. Under grace. Um, but for Romans chapter seven, Paul felt it um, imperative to kind of take a, a deep dive into exposing the weaknesses of the law. So the first part of the chapter talks about how God's grace is greater than the law. And then the latter half of it talks about how God's grace is greater than your struggle. All right. So let's begin. So we're going to start with talking about dead to the law. Verse one, know ye not brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, oh, I didn't see you walk in tonight, but I know that mm, when I hear it. <laughs> verse, verse three, so then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So what is verses 1 through 3 starting with? You know, Paul is coming right out of the gate with it. He's basically saying that the law has no authority over the living. I mean, it's only over the living, excuse me. Law has authority only over the living. My, my apologies. So in verse one, where it says the law has dominion. So think back to the last chapter. Um, at the very beginning of chapter six, we talked about where Paul told us that you're not under the law, but you are under, grace. you are under grace. Yes, this makes class go so much better when we're exchanging. And so after that discussion at the beginning of uh, chapter six, we started talking about the practical implications that he gave us. And so now he's gonna explain more completely how um, how that we are no longer longer under the domain of law. So verse one, that the law has dominion over man. So I wanted it to be clear that the ancient Greek word that was used for law, um, 
doesn't say the law. It just says law. It makes it very ambiguous. It makes it very broad. Why? Because it includes all laws. We're not under just the dominion, or he wasn't just explaining to the Romans, you're not just under your laws here in Rome. He's saying all laws, even dating back as far as the laws of Moses. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, so he's, he's referencing all law and saying that none of which have dominion over man. And so then continuing, all, continuing on, Paul makes the point that death ends all obligations and contracts. And so how does he illustrate that? He starts speaking of a wife and her contract to her husband. The contract is, is done upon death. And so should she choose to marry afterwards, it's okay because she has fulfilled her contract. But if she chooses, if she separates from her husband and he's not dead and she chooses to marry, then she'll be called a what? Adulteress. An adulteress. So verse three is just putting the, the illustration to it. You didn't like that? You don't like that? <laughs> One of the sisters up front said they don't like that. Why me? What do you want me to do? <laughs> we, we, could, we could try to call the editor. <laughs> but it's the Bible. So I'm not sure how far up the chain of command your your concern would get, but we can try. We can formulate an email. We'll do it tomorrow. No need? Okay. Wisdom says there's no need. Move on. All right. And we pray we praise God for you and your wisdom. Verse four. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another, even to whom is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So verse four is basically saying our death with Jesus sets us free from the law. But then you say our death with Jesus, but what are we talking about? Well, last week, for, for the scholars that were here last week, um, Paul explained <coughs> that, he carefully explained it too, that what dies within us? The, sin. the who? The old man. The old man. All right. All right. I put y'all got cliff notes tonight. <laughs> oh, you got the trusty dusty notebook. All right. So he carefully explained that the old man has to die. You know, you can't put new wine in the old bottle. So when you're on this path of righteousness and you're becoming new in Christ, the old man has to die. So that's what's being referenced here in verse four. That when when it says we die with Jesus. The we that's being referenced here is the old man, that, that spiritual that spiritual sense. You know, we haven't actually died because we wouldn't be sitting here talking. Um, but yes, that died with Jesus. When he talked about death with sin, he also talking about death to the law. All right? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Now, some might think that, yes, we're saved by grace, um, but we must live by the law to please God. What do you think? We've talked about this. Is that a yes or no? no? No. It's not that we have to live by the law to please God. Paul makes it very plain that believers are dead to the law as far as it represents a principle of you know living or a place of right standing with God. It's not that you have to do a certain thing um, in accordance to the law in order for God to grant you grace. There was one thing that was done for all of us to receive grace, and that was what? <laughs> When Jesus died on the cross, it didn't matter how right we were, how wrong we were. Once he did his work on the cross, we were all afforded grace. We were all afforded grace. We just need to learn to walk freely in that grace. Amen? Amen. 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 So understand that through the law, that is not an option or an avenue for salvation. We've talked about it for several chapters, but I think Paul is putting emphasis on it because every chapter, he, he, he highlights that, that it's not an, an option, it's not an opportunity, it's not an avenue for us to achieve salvation. Amen? Amen. And so also in, in verse 4, it says that you may be married to another. All right. So we're free, covered in grace, so that we can be married to Jesus. Now, when you're married to someone, what does that mean? Now, married folk definitely should have some answers to this. There's a covenant. You're one. What else? Anything else? That's it? No judgment. I'm not my business. <laughs> Say one more time. One more time. That's your per that I like that definition. That's she said that's your person. 
So if you're married to Jesus, that's your person. So what does that mean? Do you put your trust in that person? Yes. You rely on that person. Yes. When things are going wrong, you don't go to the next, on the left or the right. You go to your person. Amen. See, are you married? Mm, go ahead, girl. <laughs> go ahead, girl. I know you're not married. <laughs> Right. But because we're married to Jesus, we're not just free to live, um, live for ourselves or unto ourselves. Remember, we talked about that last week as well. Grace isn't afforded for us to just go frolicking along like la, 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 doing what we want, when we want. We've been given the grace so that we can give back unto God. Amen. 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 All right. So grace is given for us to honor him with our lives. Because one way or another, we're going to serve somebody. Amen? Amen? So we're either going to serve God and live a righteous lifestyle, or we're going to be enslaved to, to the devil or sin. Right. Any questions thus far? No? All right. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit <coughs> unto death. So here in verse 5, Paul starts explaining the problem with the law, where it says when we were in the flesh. So under the law, we did not bear fruit of God, okay? What does it mean to bear fruit? Have children. Have children. Produce. Produce. So you can bear fruit, not just um, women bearing fruit, but you can bear fruit and everything. If you want to bear fruit at your job, what would that mean? <laughs> If you're bearing fruit, let's say you're a car salesman and you're bearing fruit. That means you're doing what? You're making sales. You're selling cars and, you know, you're, um, you're turning over a profit. So here, where it says when we were in flesh, we did not bear fruit to God. So the product of our actions were not pleasing to his will. That's what it's saying there. The product of our actions, what we gave forth, was not pleasing to his will, nor was it edifying to his kingdom. Instead, we were bearing fruit to death. Recall from chapter 6 where it said that if we are not living the righteous lifestyle and grace, then we're working towards death. We're working towards death. So if we're not doing right, we're doing wrong. And if we're doing wrong, we're, we're on a highway straight to, straight to hell. Amen. Amen. Right. So verse 6. In verse 6, Paul tells us how we've been delivered from the law. Paul likes to do a whole lot of ask a question and immediately answer it. And then afterwards, he's going to give you, um, you know, some substance to support his responses. So he says that we've been delivered from the law. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. That's the new man. And not in the oldness of the letter. That's the who? No. That's the old man. We tired of that. We said good. So Paul says it plain and clear, but now we've been delivered from the law. Here he's summarizing the theme for these first few verses already. We've been delivered from the law. When Jesus died um, at Calvary, who also died? The old, the old man. Paul says it 47 times in the book, so we're going to say it 47 times in class. Right. The old man. We are dead to the law. We are delivered from his dominion over us. Um, and we're delivered from that principle of justification or, or sanctification. Because remember, we are covered by grace. grace. We are covered by grace. That's right. He just says. So the law does not justify us. It does not make us right with God. That's what I meant by justify. And the law does not sanctify us, which means it does not take us deeper with God and make us more holy before him. All right? The law is not capable of doing that. And so then later on in verse 6 where it says, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. Our freedom is not given so that we stop serving God. It's actually given so that we can serve him more. More more freely serve him better where we were giving him a two now we are free and so we can give him a five you know it's basically saying that this freedom was given to us so that we could step our game up amen? amen amen when someone's doing something for you do you want them to come halfway with it no. you want them to come full throttle so that's what the freedom of grace the freedom in grace gives us and he wants us to come full throttle behind him amen, amen. and so then <clears throat> It will make you wonder, how well do you serve in the newness of the spirit? Just think about your old man. 
that has died. We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna assume all of our old men within us have died. Yes, yeah. yes, because we're you know we're born again. Yeah. Um, but how well do we serve in the newness of the spirit? Are we doing anything differently than before? And these are kind of rhetorical. You don't have to put your business in the street. <laughs> um, so remember last week we talked about when you're transitioning from the old man to the new man, there needs to be what? What kind of change, though? Noticeable change. Noticeable change. Uh, one of the words that we used was a radical change or even a shift. Okay. Recall? So it should be evident, not that we're doing it for someone to notice and to speak on what they notice, but it should be evident in the way that you walk, the way that you talk, the way that you respond to situations. You respond different. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to look directly at you. The way that you respond to different situations. <laughs> <laughs> the way you respond to different situations, the places you you know you used to go, you don't go no more. Yeah. Yeah. Or when you go, you don't act the way you used to act when you get you know when you get there. But there should be something different about you, and it should be evident. Um, but it's unfortunate because sometimes we don't we don't want to make that change out of fear, out of fear that we won't be accepted. Or oh, we can't hang with you no more because you know you a holy roller now, you know. And so we'll. We'll dilute ourselves, we'll dim ourselves down out of fear of not being accepted when we should be operating more out of love. You know, our love for God should say, well, I don't care who's going to accept me. I'm still going to operate in this way. Yes, ma'am. You know, like, um, that's so very true. And um, this is going back to like the Cat Williams thing, what he said about all the comedians and everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm an avid listener of uh, Ricky Smiley Morning Show. Mm -hmm. And the way Ricky Smiley responded to him with so much grace, mm -hmm. it is exactly what you're saying. I was like, wow, like he, you know, of course he was like, you know, he could have went in on him, mm -hmm. but- Cause that's what you would have done? No. Cause you sound almost surprised. <laughs> no. You sound almost disappointed. No, no, no. I I'm just want, I didn't want him to go in on him though. Cause I mean, I know, I know how like, you know, Ricky Smiley was raised in the church and everything like to see. So it was just like, when you, when you, when you know better, you do better. And that's what I was trying to tell my chief. I was like, you know, when, like, you don't do the same things you did when you was, when you 30, when you was 20. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get older, you, you know better, so you do better. Right. So why respond to him the way he wants you to respond to him? Right. There's a big difference though, too, of being raised in the church mm -hmm. and then being raised in the word. Yeah. All right. Um, and so a lot of us were raised in the church. We, you know, we've been in church all our lives. But most of us were coloring on bulletins and uh, now the children uh, playing Roblox and everything else. But they go to church every Sunday, praise the Lord. But then there's a shift. There's a radical change where we start listening more. And then we go from listening and hearing to actually applying and, and living the things that we are learning. So... Um, so yeah, just be cognizant of that, you know, because it's a lot of church folk that will cuss you from Genesis to Revelation, but they've been in church all their life, but they're the best fighters on the block. Yeah. 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 Ye
sin or he's saying is the law equal to sin that's what he's that's what he's saying there now if we follow that train of thought we'll understand how someone might think that the law in in looking at what we've been studying could be equal to sin paul insisted that we must die to the law if we wanted to bear fruit to god so that would make one think something must be wrong with the law if we have to separate from it in order to be good with God. You see how that inference could be made? Mm -hmm. But then, of course, as Paul likes to do, question asked and answer, because then he goes on to say, no, the law is good because it reveals sin to us. Mm -hmm. So Paul answers the question explicitly. I would not have known sin except through the law. So the law is like... Um, like an x-ray machine like it reveals what's there but could be uh inherently hidden you can't blame an x-ray for what it shows you know wow. truth is truth <laughs> amen um and so then where it says for i would not have known covetedness unless the law had said thou shalt not covet well the law kind of sets speed limits all right so that we know exactly when we're going too fast no the law does not save us no, the law does not sanctify us, but the law does give us knowledge. It, it does give us understanding of when we're right and when we're not so right. So it's, it's almost like speed limits. So what do speed limits do for us now? When we're driving down the interstate and we know the speed limit is 55. Speed limit doesn't give you the ticket. The actual speed limit, it being posted. What does that What does that do to you when you, when you don't follow it? It gives you a guide. It gives you a guide. It provides guidance. It provides a measure, but it doesn't prosecute. If I get on the interstate right now and I go 75 miles per hour, that speed limit sign's not gonna do anything to me. Now it's gonna take a little bit more than that. So that's the same thing with the law. The law is not gonna do anything to you. It'll let you know that you're not right, but it's not gonna do anything to you nor for you, all right? So it doesn't hold us accountable. And that's what Paul is trying to convey there. All right. So moving on in verse 8, Paul tells us how sin corrupts the commandments or the law, all right? Um, all right. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, this is verse 8, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, which is lust or strong sexual desire. But Paul wanted to use his SAT terms there. He wanted to use his big word. Uh, for without the law, sin was dead. But sin, taking occasion or taking the opportunity by the commandment. So Paul describes uh, that it's a warning. It's a warning. We see it as a warning. The law is seen as a warning. But the law can also be seen as a call to action. All right? So instead of saying, thou shalt not uh, steal, don't do that. That's what the law is telling you. Just don't do that. If you stay away from that, you stay away from sin. Amen? Amen. So it's less of a warning and more of a call to action. And that's what he was ex explaining there. But it makes one wonder why, why are we so attracted to sin? I mean, we're fleshy people. We're human. So sin happens. We're sinful beings. But sometimes it's like why why do we do the things we do like when you go to a restaurant and you take extra napkins but you have paper towels at home <laughs> what about the paper towels at home can't you just take them out the house and put them in your car that's what she said we get still praying for our sister we you know <laughs> she said wow oh. but just like you take extra ketchup packets but, but you got a bottle of ketchup at the house? You don't need that for your car. No. Right. I was just, I was just waiting to see what your reason is going to be. It's like, why do we err on the side of doing little things that we really don't even need to do? Oh, we think we can do what we want to do. My girl in class tonight, y'all. We think we can do what we want to do. So is it like, is there like a pleasure attached to to acting against the law. I already have an answer. I was just waiting for y'all to tell me what y'all are doing. Bad things feel good. All right, deaconess. Teach the people. The thrill of it. This whole front row is teaching tonight. All right. So it's, it's like, um, remember the Prohibition Act? The Prohibition Act came about um, um, 
uh, concerning alcohol. And so the Prohibition Act said what? No, no, no. Don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. But what actually happened? They drank more. The total opposite. <laughs> the total opposite happened. God draws boundaries for us, but we are immediately enticed to cross those boundaries. It's the same thing that happened with that. It's like telling a child, at at. And then they look at you. Now, now they're brazen. You know, at least we try to hide ourselves. You know, once we get grown, we try to keep it under wraps so that, you know, we can still maintain our holy status. But children, children could care less about being hellion. So children, you tell them, ah, ah, and they look at you and they go, and they do it. <laughs> Waiting to see. As you said earlier, they test your gangster. Yes, indeed. But again, we're drawing boundaries for them, but they are still enticed to do wrong. Um, but that's why we have to submit ourselves to his will and not ours so that we can continue to be obedient to what he wants for our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 So the weakness isn't the law. The weakness is what? Flesh. Flesh. And flesh is who? Uh -huh. Us. We. we uh-huh. <laughs> me, myself, I, all of the above, circle D. Right, 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 right. All right. Um, we were in verse 8. All right, any questions there then? All right, let's continue on. So in verse nine, Paul highlights his state of innocence before he knew the law. So now he's using himself as an example, which good, le good leaders do. They use themselves as an example um, because they don't want to seem perfect. They want you to understand that even me, you know, in a position of, you know, leadership and hierarchy and all of that good stuff, I make mistakes too, I'm a sinner as well. So Paul's using himself here. And he says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So where he says, I was alive once without the law. It's like saying, well, come on in, come on in. It's like saying children can be innocent before they know and understand what the law requires. Mm -hmm. Seemingly so, amen? amen. And so this is what Paul's referring to when he says, I was alive once without the law. And there was a point in time where he had no understanding of it, is what he means, you know? And we've all been there. We've all been there, but we've also heard the saying that ignorance is not above the what? The law. The law. So, you know, it's our, it's our duty to understand. Uh, but then also in verse 9 where it says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When we do come to know the law, because at some point we learn, correct? Yeah. The law shows us our guilt. But it also excites our rebellion. Because like the front row said, sometimes it just feels good to sin. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> we definitely going to pray our way out of here tonight. <laughs> but it excites our rebellion, bringing forth more sin. And But if we continue to sin, that leads us to what? Death. Death. Everybody should know that at this point. That leads us to what? Death. That leads us to death. All right. So we're going to keep moving. We're going to go... Um, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12. And Paul is continuing here. Here he's saying sin corrupts the law and defeats its purpose of giving life. Once law is corrupted by sin, it brings death. So I'm reading at verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. All right. So verse 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life, or to bring life, I found to be, or to bring death. Sin does this by deception. So how does sin deceive us? Sin deceives us by giving us uh, promises of satisfaction, false promises of satisfaction. It'll make you feel better. It'll change your situation. It also falsely claims, um, it basically says that you have an excuse for. So that's what makes it okay. You have the right to do it because you deserve to. All right? And then some, and then sin falsely promises an escape from punishment. It's harmless. Nothing's going to happen if you do this particular sin. Mm -hmm. You know how we justify some of our wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and do it because remember last week, you know, we touched on taxes. We talked about lying and how none of us are liars and things like that. But it, it's also tax season, too. Mm 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> There'll be names on forms <laughs> that don't reside at addresses and things like that, but we don't lie. <laughs> right, we just let that sit in there, just let that simmer down in there. So then in verse 11, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, everybody be looking for a deduction. <laughs> Uh, verse 11, for sin deceived me. So it isn't the law that deceives us, but it is sin that uses the law as an occasion for a rebellion. All right? So the truth makes us free from the deceptions of sin. And then it says, and by it slew or killed me. Sin, when followed through, when we're participating in it, it leads to death and not life. So one of Satan's greatest deceptions is to get us to think that sin is something good and that um, that an unpleasant God would want us to deprive it of it, would, would want us to be deprived of it, excuse me. Um, again, sometimes we look at sin and it looks good. It looks enticing. It, it looks ex exciting. <laughs> so Satan tries to misconstrue that, that look of sin by saying, why wouldn't God want you to have this feeling? And so it, he tries to pervert it and make it look like something that God is trying to take from you when it's actually God trying to protect you. God is trying to warn us away from sin, all right? He, he warns us away from it because it'll kill us because sin leads to death, yeah. right? So wherefore the law is holy, Paul understands how someone might take this as saying that he's against the law, but he's not. All right. It's true that we must die to sin. We talked about that in chapter six. And then earlier in this chapter, we said that we must um, also die to the law. Correct? Correct? Yeah. Right. But that shouldn't be taken to mean that Paul believes that sin and law are in the same basket. They are not. Because the problem is not the law. The problem is us. Sin corrupts the work or the effect of the law. So that's why we must die to vote, okay? Understood there? Yes. Any clarification needed? Good deal. All right, so we're gonna move on. We're about halfway through, huh? So now Paul provides us with the purpose and character of the law. So I'm reading at verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So in verse 13, the law exposes and magnifies sin. Sin that it might appear sin working or producing death in me through what is good. So though the law provokes our sin nature, it provokes us a little bit, it can be used for good because uh, it more exposes our, our deep sinfulness. Sometimes we don't even know what we're capable of until we've done it, yeah. all right? And so without the law being there, there's nothing to shed light on it, amen? amen? But you may be sinning and not even know you're sinning until you come to an understanding of a law that's against the behavior that you're exhibiting. And you're like, oh, that's not good for me to do? Okay, so the law brings us understanding. So the law isn't bad. It's just that sin attached to it gives it kind of a, a foul look, all right? So the law basically calls you out a little bit, all right? And that's necessary. Don't we need to be called out every once in a while? Yes. Yeah, we, you know, walking through life, life as if we're perfect patties or perfect Peters, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work like that. You know, I need somebody to stand me upright every once in a while, you know, get up in my collar a little bit and tell me, now you know that's not right. Or even if I didn't know, I'm going to tell you it's not right. Because every it's checks and balance. Amen? Amen? All right. So we need sin to appear sin. We need sin to, to magnify it. We need sin to highlight it. Because it always wants to hide within us, right? Uh -huh. It wants to control it. Uh, I mean, it wants to conceal its, its true nature um, within us. So um, from verse 13, I want you to take that. I want you to remember that sin is deceitful. It'll have you out there thinking you're doing right when you're actually dead wrong. Emphasis on dead, dead wrong. <laughs> but the deception of it all will have us unaware. Because I need us to understand sin is taking us nowhere but to death. All right. 
right. It's taking us nowhere but to death. All right. Um, verse 14. The spiritual law cannot restrain a carnal man. Verse 14 reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. All right, well, let's learn something. What's carnal? What's a carnal man? Unspiritual. Say it one more time. Unspiritual. Unspiritual. No conscience. No conscience. Worldly. Weak. Worldly. Weak. Weak. Mm. That's a good term. So when I looked it up, because I wanted to make sure I gave you the good stuff, right? Um, it said that a carnal man is a Christian person with their mindset on the flesh, tending towards sin. The Bible does not refer to a non-Christian as being carnal. So the worldly folks or the Gentiles, they're not carnal. They're just fallen men. Why would you think they're not carnal? If they're still worldly or they're still the Gentiles, that means they lack what? Knowledge. They lack knowledge and understanding. So that's not used against them. So they're not carnal. They're just fallen men who are, you know, who still have the opportunity to come on inside with us and become Christians, correct? <clears throat> now, one who has begun a spiritual life, and that would be us, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Christians, have we not begun a, a spiritual life? Yes. We can be referred to as a carnal person. Why? We because we've had knowledge mm -hmm. and we know that a little something a little something yet we've made a what we made a conscious decision we've made a choice to go against what we know <clears throat> amen? amen and um so carnal uses the ancient greek word sarkikos which means characterized by the flesh and so in this context it speaks of a person who can and should do differently but does not. All right. We don't need any sarkikos right here, around here, amen? So verse 14, where Paul says, but I am carnal. The word carnal simply just, um, he's referring to his flesh. He's recognizing that the spiritual law cannot help the carnal man, amen? And then where he, where he went on to say sold under sin, he's saying that he's in bondage under sin and the law can't help him out, right? Remember the law can give us guidance, it can give us a measure, but it can't prosecute, it can't, it can't remove judgment in any way, okay? All of that is left under what? Grace. What are we under? Grace. Grace. All right, and so even though Paul says that he's carnal, it doesn't mean that he's not Christian. He's just aware of his carnality. All right, and as we should be, because we have our moments where we know better, and we don't do better. We know better, and we make the choice. And she over here talking about child. <laughs> I'm not even gonna ask you to share that story because the child is enough. But yes, we make the decision not to do better. Why? That's rhetorical, but it, it's um, and it's for me too because sometimes I make the decision not to do better. I know I shouldn't say this but I have to say it. That, that's definitely my issue. I don't know what y'all issues are, but I'll tell you, this mouth, this mouth, and there's a 10 year old version of it upstairs right now, and I can't get but so upset because she is the fruit of my lawn. And so I have, I have a better understanding of what people mean when they say it to me now, because I hear from her, I'm like, girl, you don't be quiet. You know you shouldn't say certain things, yet you just feel compelled. <laughs> or you know you shouldn't go certain places or do certain things or behave in certain ways, but you just feel compelled to do it. Well, well, we know better. We do better. We do better. All right. So then we move on. These next few verses, uh, Paul is going to describe his sense of helplessness uh, with the struggle of obedience, all right, in our own strength. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, God bless you, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, 
for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Which mm. is this crazy. <laughs> we just is crazy. It was a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of play back and forth on words, but it's really clear. It's really clear. It's really clear. So he says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. So Paul's problem, just like all of us, isn't a lack of desire. He wants to do right. Don't we all want to do right? Yes. We wake up every day, get dressed, and get ready to head out into the world because we want to do right. And then as soon as we get on Chesapeake Boulevard, somebody <laughs> cut us off because they late for work. Now I done got up, I done prayed, I done read my Bible. I got James Cleveland on the radio. I, I want to do right. And then you cut me off and, and then I feel a need to say things that I don't say anymore so that's what Paul says you know the, the problem is here it isn't a lack of desire he, he wants to do what's right and that's what that means what I will to do that I do not practice I want to do right so his problem isn't knowledge he knows what the right thing is his problem is a lack of power restraint self-control Come on, teachers. Come on, scholars. The problem isn't the knowledge. It's the application. Don't we talk about application all the time? We know. We just don't put it into practice. Oh, we, we gathering ourselves tonight, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So his problem is lack of power. And where it says how to perform what is good, I do not find. He lacks power because the law, it gives no power. Amen? Amen? The law says, here are the rules, and you had better keep them. But it gives us no power in keeping the law. It just says, this is the rule. This is what you should follow. But it doesn't give, a, it doesn't give us that will to do it. It's just a note. It's like a footnote. <laughs> By the way, this is what you should do. All right? So then in verse 17, <clears throat> now then it is no more that, no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me. Is Paul denying his responsibility as a sinner? No, no, not at all. He recognizes that as he sins, he's acting against the nature of his new what? His new, his yeah. new man in Jesus Christ. A Christian must own up to their sin, yet realize that the impulse to sin does not come from who we really are in Jesus. That's right. All right? It is not attached to our new man at all. That means that we are just borrowing from that old man again. And we talked about that. How do you how do you um, get a new job and then take lunch at your new job and go back to your old place of employment asking is there anything that you can do? It just doesn't make sense. You can't serve both. When you move from one job to another, when you've moved from sin to saved, to sanctified, to filled, you just can't serve both. Amen? Because somebody's not going to get all of you. Mm -hmm. Amen? All right. So to be saved from sin, a, mess, a man must at the same time, they have to own it, but then they also have to disown it. You have to have some understanding of your sinful nature, but you also have to have some understanding that you are trying to keep that push back. You're trying to keep that at bay. All right? And so then the next few verses talks about the battle between the two selves, the old man and the new man. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. All right, so let's take it piece by piece. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me. Anyone who has ever tried to do good is aware of this struggle, okay? We never know how hard it is to stop sinning or to stop doing something until we try to stop doing something. Think of smoking or think of drinking or think of dieting, especially if you're cutting carbs and cutting sugar, that's when you're looking for a roll. <laughs> as soon as you say, I'm cutting carbs, 
Lord, it's like every commercial got biscuits, <laughs> buns, and everything else, and you start craving it. And so there's there's difficulty. There's difficulty in understanding what you need to stop and then actually putting that action forth behind it. No man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. Okay? Okay. Um, have you ever found yourself um, behaving in a way that you didn't even realize you could you could behave? Absolutely. Ever been somewhere and someone just We'll, we'll blame it on someone. And someone just took you there. <laughs> they ain't take you there. You been there. You just didn't know that you were there. Or you didn't know that you visited there from time to time. But yeah, you know, no one knows how bad they are until they try to be good. And then when you start to be good and you look back on some of the stuff that you used to say and do, it's like shock and awe. Like, what's that really me? <laughs> or don't let someone come and tell you, be like, girl, do you remember back in the day when we would go such and such place and you used to do this, this, and this? I don't recall. <laughs> At least that would be my response. I don't recall. Do you remember? Oh, okay. Leave it there. Praise the Lord. But my, yeah, my memory doesn't serve now. <laughs> but verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after or according to the inward man. So Paul knows that his real inward man has has a delight in the law of God. He understands that the impulse towards sin comes from another law. The law that's not of God, all right? Paul knows that his real self or his new man is the one who delights um, in the law or in the will of God. Let me say will. Let me not say law because that might confuse it a little bit. So his real self is one who delights in the will of God. Amen? So the old man is not the real Paul. This is what he's saying here. The old man is dead. The flesh is not the real Paul. The flesh is, is destined to be passed away and then resurrected. Because remember, the flesh went up with Jesus. It died went with Jesus, the work he did on the cross. The new man is the real Paul. Or the new man is the real us. All right. Now, his challenge is to live like God has made him in his newness. And I, the reason why I say it's a challenge, because it's a war every day. Every single day, you have to get up and choose ye this day. Who you going to be? Who you going to serve? All right. You're living for the righteous or you're living for the ratchet. Each and every day. I preach and teach for the street. So, you know, I'm going to throw a few of them in there. Just don't fire me. <laughs> but um but right, but who are you living for? Who are you working for? Amen? Amen. All right, so there's a debate I was I was reading and studying, and I saw that there's been a debate among Christians um as to whether Paul was even a Christian during this experience um he describes. Some think that because he's struggling with sin and all of that, they believe he wasn't born again at this time. This is just a little caveat, you know. I like learning new stuff. We find ourselves in that same situation. Say that one more time. We find ourselves in that same situation. Questioning our existence. Mm -hmm. Am I even saved? Because the way I just talked to that lady <laughs> at that pharmacy, it, do I even know what a Bible is? <laughs> Jesus, do you even know my name? But yes, we yes, you are absolutely right. We question ourselves. Um, but it's it's kind of an, an uh, irrelevant question to question ourselves as to whether or not we're saved. Um, and that question does come up a lot with people, you know, um, do I need to rejoin church or do I need to uh, give my life to Christ again? No, you don't have to do it again. You fell off. Come on, fall back on. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of irrelevant to think, you know, am I still Christian and all? Yes, you are. You messed up a little bit, but yes, you are. Because it's a struggle for all of us. It's a struggle for all of us who tries to obey God with our own strength. I didn't call you and say, I disown you. Right, 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 right. But it's a struggle to, to try to obey him with our strength. We need mm. his strength, amen? amen? And so as Christians, we're going to experience struggle. We're going to experience defeat. Somebody have a question? Yes, ma'am. So shouldn't we consider ourselves like work in progress because we're working toward the ultimate goal, even though we do fall off kind of times? Yes. Or things by grace. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Are we talking to somebody? You, you saying that for somebody on the phone? No. Oh. My, uh, 
Chicago. Oh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying it like, you're, listen, because this, this is for you. I, that's what I, I thought you were giving it to someone else. So. That's right. That's right. Phone a friend. That's right. We try to all get right with Jesus. Right. But that debate, is, like I said before, it's irrelevant. We all deal with struggle and defeat. And um, as Christians, we may experience this. But as a non-Christian, we can only experience this. So as a Christian, we can struggle with uh, defeat and, and all of that stuff. But we know that we are saved under grace. So there is something better for us to walk in Amen. that we can walk freely in. But if you have not converted and you're a non-Christian, that's all you can walk in mm -hmm. is struggle and defeat. So I think we should praise God for that because... Being Christian, even though we fall, even though we error, we still have an opportunity to turn that and change that. We have an opportunity because as, as our sister so eloquently put it, we're a work in progress. Amen? Amen. 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 So verse 23, um, yes, verse 23, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of the sin. Sin is able to war within Paul here and win because Paul has no power in himself other than himself to stop sinning. And what are we strong enough to do on our own? Nothing. 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 Because if we were strong enough to do it on our own, why would we need God? Amen. Why would Jesus have to have done what he, what he did on the cross? We wouldn't have needed that. So we have to have an understanding that we can't do it alone. We can't stop sinning on our own, right? So we have to, we have to empty ourselves of sin, but we also have to fill ourselves with something in order yet to replace, absolutely, in order to, to maintain that less sinful nature, all right? All right, that's why we have to rely on who? Jesus. We have to rely on who? Jesus. All right, so in these last two verses, Paul describes the victory found in Jesus, amen? So verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So here, Paul is speaking from desperation but he um, and perspective. I'll say it like that. Oh, wretched man that I am. So the ancient Greek word for wretched is defined more as um, exhaustion of labor, you know, of hard labor. You know, I'm tired. I'm sick of tight, tight. That's what wretched would mean. So, so Paul is saying right here, I'm tired. I'm completely worn out. I'm unsuccessful. My efforts are null and void. I'm trying to please God under the principle of law, and it's just not working, so I'm tired. And so the entire tone of that statement shows that Paul is desperate for deliverance, all right? He's overwhelmed with his sense of powerlessness and sinfulness. Amen? We together? We must come to that same place of desperation to find our own victory, right? When it gets too hard for us, that's when it gets just right for, that's when it gets just right for God. It's guaranteed for us to turn it over when we're desperate. Because again, we're tired at that point. It's just like with anything. You know, when we get tired and we just wash our hands and stuff out, you do it, you do it. Have you ever been there before? When, you, when you're talking to your partner or your children or something like that, and you just get tired of going through the rigmarole, and you say, you do it, you handle it, you take it. That's what God is waiting for us to do. He's waiting for us to get sick of ourselves. Don't you get sick and tired of trying to get you right? And you just wronger and wronger every day. I'm educated, but wronger just serves the purpose here. But you're just wronger and wronger every day. You, you get tired. And then you just say, Lord, take me now, you know? Not literally, but you know, take my life and do with it what you will. Yeah. And so that's what verse 24, that's what Paul is doing here. He's acting out of desperation. Lord, I need you, I need you to help me. So your desire must go beyond like a vague hope <coughs> for getting better. Like, oh, I hope the Lord blesses me. We have to cry out. And that's what he's doing here. He's crying out against himself and crying out unto God and asking for assistance. And so then he also says, who will deliver me? He finally turns that into asking about someone else. He knows that the who isn't him delivering himself. He's given up on himself trying to do it, which he should, amen? amen? Because nobody can do it like God. He's in that pit of unsuccessful struggle against sin. And so being in that pit, even when we're in it, we get self-focused or we get self-obsessed because it's me, me, me. I got to fix this. I have to do this. I know I need to do this. I know I need to do that. Yeah, get off of yourself. Yeah. Stop relying on self 
and turn that to God. And that's what Paul is doing right here in verse 24, all right? Oh, I wanted to, to highlight this too. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So when Paul is talking about the body of death, he wanted to be free from what was clinging to him. I believe he's talking about the old man. He knows that the old man isn't good. He's trying to walk in his newness, but he knows that the old man is still there and he wants to be free from that. Now, what I did find in my study is that during that time, the ancient kings, when they wanted to torment a prisoner, they would um, shackle them to a dead body. And it wouldn't just be shackled like hand in hand. They would shackle them back to back. Now think about that. You shackle back to back with, with the dead body. The dead body's heavy. It's moving all every which way. It's not moving with you. But what what else is the dead body doing? The odor stinking, decomposing. It's probably drawing flies and everything else. Like it's just it's just an ugly situation. It is putrid and ugh, just corrupted. He wants to freak. That's how the old man sticks to us. And when we make that conscious choice to keep dibbling and dabbling with the old man, we are making a conscious choice to just strap that old man on our back and, and walk around with that. Now think about it. If you're strapping that old, smelly, putrid old man back on your back, it doesn't matter how good the new man is doing, what's going to be seen? What's going to be smelt? What's going to be felt? The old man. So we have to learn to separate from that. And if we can't separate ourselves from that, who do we need to rely on to do that? Right? Yes. Amen. So no matter how much we want to grow and change for the better, if we can't completely separate from the old man, that stench is going to be there. Message. <laughs> Verse 25. But then Paul finally looks outside of himself and he looks to Jesus. And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He starts out with a phrase in his mouth. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Finally, he looks outside of himself and he looks unto Jesus. And the first thing he says is, I just thank you. I thank you, God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has something to thank God for at this point because he knows that if he looks outside himself and he looks unto God, that there will be some deliverance. Amen? Amen. And so notice there that he says, I thank God through Jesus. Paul sees that Jesus is standing between himself and God. All right? Jesus is bridging the gap and providing that way to God. Amen? Amen. And then he refers to Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> Paul has put Jesus in the right place. Yeah. He's letting it be known that Jesus Christ is the head of my life. Yeah. When you call somebody, you know, um, you know how mm -hmm. to speak, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. That's showing respect. That's showing the position of someone in your life. So he wants you to know, he wanted him to know, you are our Lord, okay? That's what Paul is conveying there. And so where it says, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He acknowledges his struggle, but he thanks God for the victory in Jesus. And he's thanking him in advance. He doesn't pretend that looking towards Jesus takes away the struggle. Because turning to God doesn't mean the struggle disappears, right? He's not a magic genie. He doesn't operate like that. Because Jesus likes to work through us, not instead of us. So wiping all the problems away, that's too easy. Anybody could, you know. Anybody could help you if all the problems were wiped away. The problems remain there so that we can see the greatness of his power and the greatness of his might. Amen? Amen. His glories will remain, will, the truth will remain, all right? There is victory in Jesus. Um, another point of emphasis I wanted to highlight there through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul shows that even through uh, the law, um, it can't save us, but we need a savior right? He never found any peace, but he's praising God until he looked outside himself and beyond the law to his savior. All right. So he knows that the law can't save, but he knows that Jesus can, can save. All right. So you have to know what to do to save yourself, which is rely on your savior. You have to stay motivated enough to turn to someone else 
and you will be turning to your and then you have to understand that you don't know yourself well enough but there is someone who knows you very well and that is your and that is your savior and that is Romans 7 amen amen, amen. amen. <laughs> Any questions? I talked that thing. Ah, holla at your girl. <laughs> no, holla at the Lord. It's all him. It's all him. I'm, I learn a lot, though. I, le I, I take the time to learn as much as I can so that I can teach it, so that, um, so that I understand it, number one, and so that someone else understands it. So I have a lot of fun with it. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Any questions, comments, or concerns before we break for, for tonight? All right, praise the Lord. Great lesson. Great, great feedback. I love when we talk like this. It's so much more um, uh, productive. Um, next week, I think next week is supposed to be me again. I'm not sure. But whomever it is, please come either way and bring a friend. All right? All right? Deacon Stiles? Deacon Turpin? Please, if I may. Yes. And thank you again for classes. Absolutely. <clears throat> I don't want you to stand more in the camera now. I think so. We bow our heads, please, and go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we always start off, we just give you thanks, Lord, for giving us yes, another day that we you, can Lord. enjoy. Lord, we thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you share with us every day, blessings that we can't even count, but we want you to know, Lord, we're thankful for all that you do for us. Lord, help us to receive the message that we received tonight. Help us to take it into our hearts, into our minds, into our souls. Help us to live it so that we can grow closer to you, Lord. It's in Jesus Christ. Holy name, we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.